I want to pray about what's going on in Israel. But I want to be really clear about something. As a Christian, as someone who studies the Word of God, um, God is not anti-anyone, except maybe Hamas. They have a, a, an evil regime who are they're in their charter, want to destroy every single Jew on the planet of Earth. Don't make this about uh, Israel versus Palestine. And, and here's why I say that. When Israel was first coming into the promised land, they were about to march around Jericho seven times. Joshua was alone, and suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared to him as a mighty warrior. And if you remember this story, Joshua said to him, are you for us or against us? And what did the angel say? No. Now, I trust the sovereignty of God. I don't, nothing happens in this world without God's awareness, and it's going to work out according to God's plan. And so as you pray, don't choose a side. There are many, many millions of innocent people who are caught up because of people who are hungry for power and money and revenge. And so pray, because this, this, is, this is just horrific um, and it has been for a long long time so let's pray together God thank you for your sovereign plan for this world and that when these kind of things happen it's hard to hear it's hard to watch and we got God we know that there are many many uh, people who are caught up in this just because of where they were born and somehow, God, I pray you would intervene, you would somehow bring peace, um, and that you would limit the devastation in people's lives. And that even beyond that, God, somehow you would bring uh, the message of hope, the only message of hope that this world um, needs. Whether they were born on one side of the border or the other, they all need you Jesus. And so make yourself known uh, through this uh, tragic situation. And now, God, as we study your word, just give us attentive hearts and minds. And I, I pray that you'd help me to get through this this morning as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're in study of Proverbs, and I got to apologize. I, I may have misled you last week. I looked at my schedule we're not scheduled to talk about sex today. I'm going to talk about something uh, that you probably don't want me to talk about. I'm going to get up in your business a little bit today. I'm going to talk about your money. But let me say this. Let me say this. God wants more for you than he wants from you. And if God really wanted your money, he would take it. The IRS does, right? And so this is really about what God wants for you. And it's about what I want for you. Because it's, the money isn't the issue, the heart is the issue. And if God doesn't have your heart, he probably doesn't have your wallet or your purse. Proverbs 15, 16 says, Better to have a little with fear of the Lord than to have great treasure and inner turmoil. And that is the foundation, right? That is the beginning, fear of the Lord. Everything we approach in life, everything we deal with in life, if it is not um, being driven by the fear of the Lord, which is, which is not being afraid of God, remember, it's not afraid of God, it's afraid of not having God. It's a holy awe and respect for who God is. And Proverbs has a lot to say about our money. In fact, uh, Proverbs says a lot about money in terms of its incredible blessing in our lives. Listen to this. Uh, just a few verses. Lazy people are soon poor. Hard workers get rich. 
Wise people manage their money well and they grow their riches. A wise man leaves behind an inheritance for his kids and grandkids. And the Bible is never against wealth, it's never against money, it's never against even being rich. But Proverbs also tells us that money can be dangerous. It's like fire. It's good, but it's dangerous. Proverbs 11.28 says, Trust in your money, and down you go. But the godly flourish like leaves in spring. Let me tell you why money is dangerous. Uh, Three reasons why money is dangerous. First of all, money can distract you from what's really important in life. Love, character, for example, who you really are when no one's watching matters way more to God than how much money you have. Proverbs 22 verse 1 says, choose a good reputation over great riches. Choose being held in high esteem. It's better than silver or gold. Now, watch a family whose matriarch or patriarch die. Watch the the children and the grandchildren, especially the children, fight over who's going to get what and how much. Uh, Some of us pursue jobs that will give us more money instead of thinking Uh, As part of the equation, what is God's purposes for me? What was I designed to do while I am on this earth? And most of us know that the more we make, sometimes it brings with it more stress. Uh, If you've had the opportunity to be blessed and buy a house, you know how much more (laughs) stress that can be. Instead of calling the landlord, hey, fix it. (laughs) Proverbs 11.4 says, Riches won't help on the day of judgment, but right living can save you from death. Which leads to the second point. It gives us a false sense of security and safety. Money gives us a false sense of security and safety. And yet, rich people get cancer. Rich people deal with divorce. Rich people have kids that rebel. You're not immune to problems just because you have a lot of money. And then thirdly, money can distort our view of ourselves. Uh, There's something about wealth that causes people to think that because they are really good at making money and managing money, making their money work for them instead of working for money, that they tend to be really good at everything else as well. Just watch Hollywood, uh, who many of them think that their opinion is just gold. But it's pride. Pride keeps us from the most important relational skill there is, which is humility. And the danger of money is not just for people with money. It's also dangerous for people without money as well. See, it's not money that is the problem. A lot of people misquote Paul when he writes to Timothy and he says, a lot of people misquote by saying money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's not it. Does anybody know what it is? The love of money. The love of money. And the truth is, is that how we manage our money, how we use our money, is a litmus test for where our heart is at with God. And this is important because we can delude ourselves and and deceive ourselves into thinking that we're okay, that we're right with God, that we're good. But what the litmus test is, is what do you do with your money? How do you manage your money? How do you view money? Jesus made it real clear in the Sermon on the Mount. Wherever your treasure is there, the desires of your heart will be also. And so again, let, let me repeat what I said at the beginning. This message about is about what God wants for you, not from you. God wants to free you from 
the anxiety and the fear that some of you live in constantly because of money. He wants to free your, your marriage up from the conflict and the tension and the fights that are often over money. Now, when it comes to our wealth, there are four decisions we need to make about our wealth, about our money. Every follower of Christ needs to make these four decisions. Uh, Proverbs 3 says, honor the Lord with your wealth. Okay, wh what does that mean? Uh, honor him with your wealth, with the best part of everything that you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. So four things, four things you need to think about and do when it comes to your wealth and your money. Number one, choose a percentage of your income on which to live. Choose a percentage. We all do, whether we know what that percentage is or not. We choose a percentage to live on. Most Americans, the average American, has chosen to live on 110% of their income. See, it's better to choose to not own something than to own something you can't afford. And when your lifestyle is below your income, that's what we call peace of mind. That's what we call margin in our lives. That's what we call opportunity to be generous. That's what we call freedom. See, when we choose to live according to a certain percentage of our income, it carries with it a huge advantage. For example, a recession hits, a job loss, a layoff. Suddenly, your income dips. Your lifestyle doesn't have to. And by the way, all the stress and the heartache and the, the confusion and the, the, uh, the anger and the fear that comes along with those circumstances that are out of our control sometimes. And so when it comes to choosing a percentage to live on, start low, especially those of you that are young, 20s, 30s, 40s, if you're still young. Um, start low. Number one stress in marriage is finances. Number two, anybody know? Sex. Sex. And some people are thinking right now there's not enough of either. <laughs> so choose a percentage. Maybe evaluate what you've been doing up to this point in your life. Let the scriptures speak to you in what God would have you choose. Second thing, and, and this is especially, f I, some of you do this really well. Some of us don't. There are people in this church who I'm convinced will help you if you have a real struggle managing your finances. But the second thing you need to do, if you're going to be a good steward with what God has given you, and that's really what this is all about, it's about being a good steward. Track your spending. Here's a phrase that should be, never be connected with money. It seems to me That should never be spoken talking about money because money is black and white. It is what it is. You spend what you spend. You have what you have. You can narrow it down to the penny if you're tedious enough. Secondly, in terms of tracking your spending, the more you have, the more important this is because the more likely you are to waste. Remember, you're a steward. But when you track your money, it makes adjustments easy. So choose a percentage, track your spending. Thirdly, get rid of dumb debt. Get rid of dumb debt. And this is where I say you might need someone. If some of you are in dumb debt, and what I mean by dumb debt is not buying a house or something that appreciates, 
Credit card debt is dumb debt. I've heard nightmares just in the last few weeks about some of the credit card companies, what the interest rates are shooting up to. Unbelievable in the 20s and 30s, 40s percent. Unbelievable. Proverbs 22 verse 7 says, Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is slave to the lender. Proverbs 13 11, Wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. See, you can work really hard to stay out of debt or to get out of dumb debt, or you can do what Tim McGraw says, live like you were dying. But I'll tell you what, it is amazing. It is absolutely amazing how God shows up when you commit to doing things God's way. I think there's three basic, very simple ways to save money. Um, consider buying used versus new, whether it's a car or clothing. We live in the capital, I think, of secondhand clothing, and so there's some really good stuff out there. Uh, don't buy things spontaneously. Costco is really, really smart. <laughs> they lose money on those tasty, tasty things rotisserie chickens but they know you'll stop at five other places on the way to get that <laughs> and you'll end up spending more money than you expected when you go in and then thirdly uh, and this is probably the number one money waster for the younger generations eating out starbucks quick drive through it's, it's convenient um my older kids, I don't know if we did this with Johnny so much and, and Kira, but the older kids knew that when we went to a restaurant, it was rare, we'd go to a restaurant, you can order something, but no soda. That was my way of saving money. And so water only. Um, so I'm not against eating out, but, but I mean, it is so much of a money saver. If you'll buy the food at Safeway or wherever you shop, and bring it home and prepare it and make it. It's more of a hassle, yeah. It's more work, yeah. Anyway, th there's probably a lot of other ways we could save money, but uh, I'll let you kind of work that out, think through that. Fourthly, I call this the 101080 rule. Arrange your finances, finances so that you can first give to God. Now, th th a lot of us want to say that God is first in our life. But if you don't give first, can you claim that he's first in your life? Or is that just kind of therapeutic for yourself? Give first. Save second. Live on the rest. 10, 10, 80. Give 10%. Save 10%. Live on 80%. And, and the younger you are, the, the sooner you start this, the more freedom, the more, the more uh, financially secure you're going to be as you go into your 40s, 50s, 60s, and even 70s. Now, here's why I suggest this rule, because God honors it. I, it's a very practical way to put God first. And it also puts other people first in our life. I, I know most of you want to be generous. I mean, if you were just really gut-level honest with me, you want to be a generous person. But sometimes bad decisions, bad management of finances, bad stewardship limits our ability to be generous people. And what we end up doing is we give a buck to a guy in a corner to kind of appease that pain of guilt. Here's another reason why living the, by the 10 10 80 rule is important. Um, You'll never, except under extreme circumstances, go into debt. And, get this, it breaks the power of greed. It breaks the power of greed that it has on our hearts and our lives. And you can be a greedy person with a lot of money, or you can be a greedy person with little money. It is not about the amount of money. It is a heart issue. And when you cho choose to give first, begins to break that power 
of greed that we all struggle with. And it bridles our discontentment. You receive thousands of messages every day convincing you that you're missing something. That if you just had. And there's, there's a level of discontentment in you that was there that you thought would go away when you made that last big purchase. And it's still there. It's an insatiable appetite, greed is. It always wants more. Always wants more. And, by the way, when we do the 10 10 80 rule, it invites God to be an active part of this realm of our life. And, by the way, miraculous things happen. Let me tell you just a, a simple story. This happened to me a couple of weeks ago. Our washing machine broke. And I don't want to have to go get another one. I'm shopping, I'm looking for new ones, used ones. And I found a really good one-year-old one uh, washer over in Saratoga. M somebody was moving. I'm like, yes, this is a great price. I called him up. I set up a time to go get it. But when I went home, and I kind of pushed a button. I turned a knob. It worked. <laughs> I did a load of laundry. <laughs> yes, thank you, God. And then it broke again. I said, I told my wife, when I get home, I'll show you the secret. I pushed the uh, turn and the. <laughs> it didn't work. It's done. I looked on YouTube. Maybe I could have fixed it. And I kind of started looking into that. And then all of a sudden, my wife, where were you? Boulder Creek? Mount Hermon? Mount Hermon? Somebody gives her their washing machine. We get a free one. <laughs> And it works great. And so we don't have to go out and spend the money. And, and, and I had just given above and beyond my normal giving because I have a rule. If there's any young person who's going on a mission trip, I just have a rule. I'm going to give. And I had just done that. And, and it, you know, so I, I gave that money and then I thought, oh, no, I don't, I don't want to have to get a washer. And I got an emergency fund, so we're, we're not going to go without a meal or anything like that. But... Uh, it was just a reminder that when we honor God, he shows up sometimes in miraculous ways. I love the quote, a coincidence is when God remains anonymous. And so as you consider what to give, uh, the average American gives about 2.5% to all charities. The average churchgoer gives about 4%, but most of this giving is on accident. It's not pre-decided. It's not predetermined on what someone is going to give. It tends to be unplanned. It tends to be emotionally driven. It tends to be spontaneous. And so I want to recommend to you, I'm going to give you a website to go to if you're at the grocery store or somebody says, hey, can you donate? Um, Go to CharityNavigator.org. They will tell you what that organization, how much of an overhead they have, how much they use for administrative costs, and how much of what you give actually goes to the cause that they claim to be raising money for. There are a lot of scams out there. And they pull on your emotional uh, heart uh, your, uh, to kind of convince you to give. So, maybe... Someone in here is thinking, well, should I give if I'm trying to get out of debt? Should I give if I'm trying to get out of debt? Yes. Yes. Malachi 3.8. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Uh, let me tell you a quick story about a guy who was a deacon in a church. This goes back many years. Young pastor, 19 years old, little brash, kind of harsh. And uh, in fact, he admits that he would not do this at this point in his life. But at 19, one of his deacons came to him and said, I missed paying my tithes for a while. It adds up to $400. What do you think I should do, pastor? Should I give it? And he said, yeah. Why rob God? Well, he got really angry at that answer, and he decided not 
to give that $400. And the next day there was a flash lightning storm and a lightning struck his horse, killed it. That horse was worth $400. And he blamed the pastor (laughs) to the point where it started to split the church. A couple weeks later, this deacon's wife called and said, can you please come pray for him? He's dying. He was literally on his deathbed dying. And you know what the pastor's response was? Praise God! Before you get upset there. (laughs) I kind of read that and I said, what? And and, and the wife was like, what do you mean? Did you hear what I said? He's on his deathbed. He says, yeah, I've been praying that God would intervene. I've been praying that God would would help him understand truth. And, And so... But he says, I will absolutely come over and pray. He started to gather everyone from the church. And pretty soon, 400 people were gathered in this guy's house and on the porch around. It was a big country house. And he had the guy get out of bed. His wife said, he can't. He's dying. He said, God will give him the strength. God will give him the strength. He came down. They laid hands on him. They poured oil on him. And immediately, he stood up and started dancing. And praising God all over. Um, God does that once in a while. I'm not saying that God's going to do that every time for everyone. Sometimes we give and we don't see results like that. The guy on TV with the $100 haircut, he'll tell you. He'll tell you that if you give, you'll get immediate blessings doesn't always happen that way. Giving needs to be approached in this way. God, I'm going to obey simply because you asked me to obey. Not because I'm going to get something back. Not because I'm going to win some prize or win the lottery. Um, I'm going to trust you. That over the course of time, over the long haul of my life, as I steward what you have given me, and the gifts and the talents that you've given me to be able to make money and make a living. I'm going to trust that you will meet all of my needs. And that you will surprise me once in a while, God, and bless me. Finally, seek to be a generous person. Um, if you're newer to Boulder Creek Community Church, you might not trust me, and that's okay. You might not trust, trust churches. And and I get it. This is about what God wants for you, not from you. And so don't give until you get to know us and trust us. But find a way, if it's not Boulder Creek Community Church or some other organization, um, find a way to put this into practice. You are planting seeds and investing in what you will experience in heaven to some degree. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25 says, Give freely and become wealthier. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper, and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. See, we can be generous with our time, with our hearts, with our homes, with possessions, But it all starts with money. And we don't get credit for what we leave behind on this earth. We get credit for what we give. And if you do this, if you can learn to do this with just your money, you will become a more generous person that most of you desire. You will be financially secure. You will have more contentment in your life. And you won't get caught off guard when things happen and you'll be better prepared for what God has planned and in store for you and so as we come to communion let me say this when you begin to see your wealth and your life through the lens of eternity it changes everything right now it might seem like a bad investment Where does that money go? How's it used? It might seem like a bad investment. When Jesus went to the cross, it seemed like failure. It seemed like a bad investment of his life. 
But Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Let's pray. God, I know for some people this is an uncomfortable subject. It's a difficult subject. But God, I just I want to remind myself and I want to remind all of us that it is not about what you want from us. It is about what you want for us. And so God, I pray that we can take the next step in our faith when it comes to our finances. And that God, as we are stretched in this area, to obey you, to be generous, whatever that means, whatever that looks like for each individual. God, we trust you that you will meet our needs and provide for us in ways that we can't even think or imagine sometimes. And so God, bless every person in this room today, wherever they're at on their faith journey. Thank you that they're here today. And I trust that you will... Um, they take communion i trust god that you will let that truth embed itself in our hearts that you who are rich became poor for us thank you for that in jesus name amen